Okay, hello everyone and welcome to this video which looks at surge functions. So you may remember I posted a video recently about the logistic modelling. Well, uh, this is another type of function that we can work with and do some modelling with. And uh, again, this one is, can actually be applied to the study of medicines, the amount of uh, paracetamol or other different drugs you have within your system. Or it can also be linked to things like radiation. So uh, just to look at the model, this is what it looks like as a function. You can see that it has quite a steep rate of increase and it has a maxima before having a uh, increasing rate of decrease. And then it reaches a point of inflection where the rate of decrease decreases. Okay, so um, that's pretty much an overlook of just what the shape is. But now let's have a look at some of the specific features, because you may remember the logistic model had a few little uh, properties and preferences up its sleeve. So with this surge function, there are a few things to note. It passes through the origin, 0, 0, has a maxima with the time value being 1 over b. Again, the general form for this function can be seen there, at e to the power of negative bt. And uh, we also have a point of inflection where the time value is 2 over b. And we also have an actual corresponding y-coordinate, an output value for the point of inflection, which is represented by 2a over 2be squared. Okay, so uh, from that we've got a few questions that we're able to work through. And again, uh, we'll just make our way through them all. We will need a graphics calculator, so I'll just grab over and reach one. And uh, let's go ahead and get into it. We'll be using some of these things they're up on the board here throughout the course of the video. But the first one is explain why the surge function always passes through the origin. So point zero, 0, Well, if we have a look at the general form of a surge function, which I have also up there, and we look at what happens at time equals 0, because again, that's going to be our input, time equals 0 at the very beginning, 0. And um, what happens when time equals zero is we get a lots of zero, lots of e to negative b lots of zero. Okay, and um, you should know by now that when we times anything by zero, it's going to be equal to zero. So a times zero is zero, and then zero times e to the negative b lots of zero, that's also going to be zero. So the entire thing is going to be zero. So at t equals zero, there's always going to be an output, whatever the output is. It might be, uh, in the case of radiation, microsieverts per hour, or in the case of um, medicines, it may be uh, parts per million. But the output at t equals zero will always be zero. And in context of most, most of the problems we look at with the surge function, this makes sense, because uh, you obviously won't have any radiation before there is a nuclear problem. You won't obviously have any... Uh, uh, things in your bloodstream, any chemicals in your bloodstream, without first having medicine. And there's just a little justification for it. So when we substitute in t equals zero, uh, we always get zero as the output because of the fact that when you multiply anything by zero, you get zero. There's just a little bit of proof for you. Okay, so now let's start having a look at some more questions regarding the surge model. So I'll just clear off a bit of board space here. And uh, we're going to be looking at the application of radiation and radiation levels. Okay, so the very first question, and it's a, quite a few parts to this question, but it asks, regret, oh, well, it says, regression analysis produced a model for the radiation levels around a nuclear disaster site. And this model was given by radiation at a given time. And again, radiation is in microsieverts. 45 Te um, to the power of negative 0.4 T. So as you can see, that's in the form of a surge function. And um, we can actually prove that. In fact, that's one of the questions I'll go through in a minute. But that's the radiation levels that are given around a disaster site. And it asks us to show that the derivative of this function is given by another value that I'll write up in just a moment. And it asks us what the purpose of the derivative is, or what the derivative is in context. So as our part A of the question, it gives us the derivative as being the r prime of t equals, and it tells us that's going to be 45e to negative 
5t, and then it says take 18t, lots of e to the negative 0.4t. That e should probably be down a bit. Sorry for my shocking handwriting. But uh, anyway, I think you get the idea. So it tells us that we need to prove that that is the first derivative of the function. Okay, so um, what I'll do is I'll move this derivative up here, actually, for the time being, so I get some working space. And then we'll go through the process of using the rules of differentiation we have learned to ensure that that is indeed the derivative. Okay. So the R of t equals that. Well, what we need to do here is identify which rule we're going to use. And I think it's quite safe to say that the product rule would probably be the most straightforward. So we have two different terms. We have 45t as being our f of x. And then we have our e to the power of negative 0.4t as being our g of x. And we know based on the product rule that uh, the derivative, which I'll just denote here as the r prime of t, equals the f prime of, and I'll make it prime of t in this case, f prime of t, lots of g of t, plus the g prime of t, f of t. And that's our product rule. Okay, so if we go ahead and look at that general form and differentiate, let's see what we get. So, the derivative of our first function, the f prime of t, and it's 45t, and again, whenever there's a coefficient and then a pronumeral, the derivative is just that coefficient, because of course that's t to the power of 1, so when we end up subtracting 1 from the exponent, it's going to be t to 0, which is anything raised to the power of 0 is going to be 1. So it's just going to be 45 times 1, which is 45. And then we write the second term as is, so 45e to the power of negative 0.4t. And then the next part, we actually take the derivative of the second term. So it's going to be plus, and uh, the derivative of the second term, in order to do this, what we do is we notice that it's an e to the power of f of x, so we rewrite it, and then, well, it's e to the power of something. I, I just denote it as f of x to be generic. But uh, what we do is we rewrite it, and then we take the derivative of the exponent. And in this case, it's again a coefficient, and uh, a pronumeral, so it's just going to be the coefficient based on the logic that I gave you before. And then, of course, that's going to be multiplied by the original part of the function, the f of t, which in this case is 45t. And there we go, we have the elongated version of the r prime of t. However, it's not the version that they actually give us, because they actually give us 45e to the power of negative 0.4t, take 18t to the power of e to negative 0.4t. Well, we've got a few terms here. How about we try simplifying? Okay, and what I'll do is I'll probably just go up here, the r prime of t equals, and we can't really simplify this first part of the equation here because it's already pretty simple. And also in context of what we should be getting, it also makes sense as well, because that's what it is up there. But now we have negative 0.4 and 45t. Well, hang on, how about we actually multiply the negative 0.4 and the 45 together to make it nice and simple? And if that's the case, negative 0.4 times 45, use your calculator to work it out, you should get negative 18t, because of course there's still a t there. So it's negative 18t, and then we just have e to the power of negative 0.4t left over which I can't actually write in there because I'm running out of space. And that is how we actually get that answer there. We've now actually proved that that is the first derivative. So now we need to understand what it is in context. And to ensure that you actually... I'll just rewrite that a little bit neater probably. <laughs> um, but to make sure it's all good, what I'll do is I'll just... And that's the exponent down there. But uh, in context, it means that this is the rate of change per hour at a given point on the function. So if we were to evaluate it here, we could see if the radiation's increasing or decreasing. It's the rate of change in the radiation level. That's an explanation of the context. And so we've looked at differentiation, and we've, we're not actually going into the surge model just yet, but we've got an understanding of what we're in for. 
So now what we need to do is we need to move on to the next question and start understanding some of the key concepts behind this little curve here. So the next question asks, explain the features that suggest this is a surge model. Okay, so we're given our function again, the R of t, 45e to negative 0.4t, and that equals our R of t. And it asks us to explain what things make you think it is a surge model. Well, let's actually compare it to the general form of a surge model. In fact, I won't write R of t there, I'll just write that. Yep. But okay, the way we can actually look at this is we can go, and there should be a t in there, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but what we can actually see is that there is a position for the constant, which we can see here is 45. There is then a t value. There is then an e value. There is then a constant, which has a negative operation in front of it. And then there is then a t value again. So we can see just by looking at the pattern of what happens in our different functions that this could possibly be a surge model. In fact, it is a surge model. But you could just sort of get your head around that idea by actually evaluating the parts and how they fit together. So you can see that that definitely isn't a logistic model because there's no limiting feature. There's no numerator that limits it. And um, essentially the actual um, variable t occurs twice as well. So you can see that there's differences in models, and that will help you suggest that that function could be a surge model. If you didn't know and you had a table of values, you could uh, plug them into your calculator, as I explained in the last video, and you could check the different um, models and see which one resulted in the least um, correlation from the model. But you can see that that's why it's a surge model, because all the parts from the generic form link up with the actual function that we're given. Okay, so that's good, and we're on to the third part of this question, still on the same question. But it asks us to find the time at which the radiation was at a maximum, and find the exact, and I'll highlight the word exact there, value of the maximum radiation at this time. Okay, and this is where we can use some cool properties, this surge function. What do we know from this? Well, we know that the t value, the t maximum value, where, um, well, not t max value, I should say the radiation value at a maximum occurs when t is equal to, and I won't actually jump straight to the answer, but it occurs at 1 over b. Because as you can see here, it's 1 over b, and we have an equal length from the origin to the maximum to the point of inflection, because that's 1 over b and that's 2 over b, so we can see that that's one of the properties the surge function has. And it's because of that that we can immediately identify what time it will be when the radiation level is at a maximum. Okay, so we've thought about this. We've got T is 1 over B at a maximum. So what we do is we just identify which part of our function was B. And again, we have our R of T up here, 45T E to the power of negative 0.4T we can see that the B term is just going to be 0.4, not negative 0.4, because as you notice here in the function, it's negative B in the surge model. So we just want the actual value without the negative there. And again, it wouldn't make sense if we had a negative value as being the maximum, given the shape of this function as well, because if that denominator was negative, then we've got a bit of a problem there, don't we? So because of that, we know that uh, the t value at the maximum is going to be 1 over b, which is going to be, and we just look at it out of the function, going to be 1 over 0 0.4. And what we can do is we can plug this into our calculator, and it will, you know, just see if we can simplify. And if we do plug it into our calculator, we can see that it's actually equal to 2 fifths. And then we can write that as a fraction to be more exact than a decimal, and we can write that as being 5 over 2. I know that they have the same sort of precision, they represent the same value, but sometimes it's nicer to work with fractions. And so because of that, 
we know the time at which maximum radiation is going to occur. The maximum radiation level is going to occur 2.5 hours, and then we put it into our context, so it's going to be 2.5 hours after the nuclear disaster occurred. Okay, that's awesome. So we know our T value at the maximum. I'll just write it up here. What we can do now is we can work out the exact level of radiation there. And that doesn't mean plugging the function into your calculator and getting a decimal approximation. We need something more precise because that word exact tells us, hang on, we need to not just estimate, we need to get a value that is a true representation. So in order to do this, what we do is we just plug t into the function and we can look at how we might be able to possibly simplify. Because again, that will help us get an exact value. So the r of t equals 45t to the negative 0.4t, as I wrote up there. But what we can do now is we can actually take out the t's and replace them with 5 over 2. So that's going to be 5 over 2 there. And again, fractions help us be more precise than decimals. 5 over 2, especially in this sort of scenario. So what we can do here is we can also write this as negative 4 over 10. How can we do this? Well, um, what you can do is we can see that it's 0 0.4, and that's going to be 4 over 10. And we can see that there's a negative operation in front of it. So if we were to rewrite it, we'd get this. Oops, I'm writing it in the old way again. Negative 4. Oops, I missed out E actually as well. Negative 4 over 10, lots of 5 over 2. Okay, so because we got those B and T terms there as the exponent, it'd be really awesome if we could simplify them and make it nice and neat. So in order to do this, we just go, well, it's 4 tenths times by 5 over 2, and it's really easy to multiply fractions. You just need to go across. 4 times 5 is 20, and 10 times 2 is 20. So it's 20 over 20. And anything over itself is equal to 1. So we've just gone ahead and we've simplified 0 0.4 times by 5 over 2 down to just 1. And we've got to remember that because the first term was negative, this will be negative 1 that we have there. And so we can rewrite this as being 45 lots of 5 over 2 e to the power of negative 1. Now that's a pretty exact value. It's quite round, it's quite simplified. However, we can actually go further. We can actually multiply these two together and get a fractional representation. So in order to do this, just uh, head to your calculator if you want to, or you could multiply out the numerator and denominator. It'll be quicker for me on the calculator, and I've already showed the multiplying process once. So we get 112.5 as being 45 times by that 112.5. And uh, from that, what we can do is we can say, okay, let's write that over 2. So 112.5, what we do is we multiply it. 112, 112 by 2, because that tells us how many halves are in 112. So we get 224, and then we add on an extra half, so it's going to be 225 over 2. In fact, hopefully that should fit on, but I'll just rewrite it in case it doesn't quite. 225 over 2, lots of e to the power of negative 1. And then, when we actually look at this, what we can do is we can substitute it in and see if we've simplified correctly. So, you just go 225, lots of 2, then you press second function, get the e to the x, and go to the negative 1 there. And we get 41.4 as being our answer there. 41.4, and remember units, microsivets. Okay, now just to make sure that we've actually gone through this correctly, what we can do is graph the function. So press the Y1 button on your TI-84 calculator and type in 45x and then go e to the power of negative 0.4 and uh, then put x in there. And then just survey where the maximum is. And you may need to adjust the window size for the surge function. Again, think about 
the 41.4 here. If it's correct, then your y max may only need to be 50 to get a true representation of the function. It's all about getting a good representation, though, when you, especially when you have to draw a graph, because you need to think about, well, hang on, am I showing what it looks like? Because if I stretch it out one way in one direction, it could not be a really good representation. But um, once you've got your calculator loaded and it's all ready to go, you can just press second function calculator, go into maximum, go left bound. So you want to go left of our maximum that we know is correct, 5 over 2, because we use the properties of a surge function to be able to work it out. And then we go to the right, and it should give us a value of 41.38, which is the same as what we got here, which is 41.4 when rounded. So that is the maximum radiation level, 41.4 micro civets. Again, units are important. Think about the context. So the maximum radiation is going to happen after two and a half hours, and it's going to be 41.4 micro civet hours. Cool. So now that we've done that, we can look at the next question. So I'll just clear some board space. And again, that shows you how you can use the properties on the function and fractions in order to get an exact value. Because again, we are able to get an exact value there for the time, thanks to 1 over b property for the maximum of a surge function. And we were also able to get an exact value by simplifying fractions when we substituted them back in. So now, at the time, okay, so we need to find at what time was the radiation decreasing at the fastest rate. And in order to do this, we need to think about where it would be that the actual radiation decreases at the fastest rate. Now, the point of inflection, in case uh, I didn't point it out before, is actually where we have an increasing rate of decrease there, and then after that, it decreases. So we have an increasing rate of decrease, it decreases at a steeper rate, and then after that point, it decreases at a lower rate. The rate of decrease is decreasing. Because as you can see here, there's not a lot of decrease happening. So now, what we can tell about this point of inflection, because it actually changes the rate of decrease, is that it must be the steepest point. So the point of inflection is the fastest rate of decrease. Or increase, depending on which way you look at it. But here we're looking at decrease with the context of the model, because it's a surge function. And because of that, we can actually find the point at which there is that most significant change. Okay, so in order to do this, what we need to think about is we need to think about, well, if we have 2 over b and 2 over a b e squared, as shown by the model for the point of inflection, we need to think about how we substitute in our values to work out when, in terms of time, the actual, um, actual radiation level will be the lowest. So 2 over b, and we identified b before as being 0 0.4, so that's going to be 2 over 0 0.4. And uh, when we plug that into our calculator, and we have 2 divided by 0 0.4, we get 5. And that makes sense from what I was saying before, because 2.5 was when our maximum radiation occurred, and these distances here on the t-axis are the same, because that's 1 over b, and that's 2 over b. So think about the scale. So after 5 hours, the rate of radiation is decreasing fastest at that point of inflection. Now, if we wanted to, we could actually plug in the values from here based on this general form given at the point of inflection on a surge function to be able to work out what the radiation would be at that point. We could go ahead and do that, but uh, I reckon we'll just move on because the question didn't ask it. It just wanted to know the time. It didn't want to know the level of radiation at that time. It just wanted to know when the most repair was being done or the, the um, radiation rate was decreasing at the most. So, what we can do now that we've answered that question is look at a few other things around the surge function. So, we've looked at the point of inflection, we've looked at the maxima, now we've got another question here that says, 
when will the actual acceptable radiation level be reached if the acceptable radiation level is 0 0.37 microsiever-hours? And of course that's important because we want to know when people can actually go near there without being at risk. So that's the safe level and we want to know when this function, which asymptotes against the x-axis, will actually reach 0 0.37 as the output for radiation. So what we do is we can't actually solve this using a function because we run into quite a problem. If we have a look at it and we go 0 0.37, which is our microsivert value, and we set that equal to the function, we'll notice that there's two t values and we can't directly algebraically solve it. Well, there is a way around this and that's very important to acknowledge because uh, otherwise without well, you could technically solve it, but uh, I won't go there. And what we could do is um, just to be able to get the idea of when it will be at that safe radiation level, we just need to simply draw a line using technology and find the point of intersection. So on our T84, we want to find this point because we can't really solve it algebraically. So we've got our function in our T84 from before under the y equals menu and you want to also have y equals 0 0.37. Now you will need to adjust your window size and make sure it is suitable. You may need to have a decent amount of hours because it may take a while. It may also take trial and error in order to get this. So I'm setting a decent window size but I don't want it to be so large that I can't actually see the point of intersection between this low level and um, the actual uh, function itself. Because again, I'm going to need to be able to use the intersect function to be able to solve it. So I'm drawing the function now, and it will also draw the line across it. And from there, we just need to use the intersect function. So I'll just leave it load for a moment, and um, we'll find out what the safe radiation level is in just a second. And what you may also need to do in some cases is find the time between where uh, the paracetamol level, if we're looking at medical application, is, which is over um, 100. Because when you have 100 parts per million, you obviously are, you, if you have more than that, you don't want to put too much more into your bloodstream. So you have to think about how long it can be before you take another dose of paracetamol. So you need to work out the differences in time. So you do the same thing on your calculator using your T84. You'd evaluate the intersection there and get a T value, and you'd evaluate the intersection there and get another T value, and you get the difference between the two, and that would tell you how long something occurs for, whether it is the actual um, amount of time the paracetamol in your body is greater than 100, or whether it's the time something else relative to that time context is also in play. So you may need to work out multiple points of intersection in order to solve this. But now I, uh, I've actually got my little graph set up here. My window size is okay. I can see the, uh, the 0 0.37, the safe radiation level, but uh, again, it could be smaller. What I went for for a window size was an X max of 25, and I also went for a Y max of 5. So now I go to second function calc and I go to Insect, and I want to click on the first curve. So bring the cursor near to the point of intersection, and click on the first curve, and then go across and uh, click on the 0 0.37, and it should give you a point of intersection, and it says that this is at 19.4. And I said hours as being the original context of the problem, However, I'm starting to think that it may actually be more suitable for this to be days instead of hours. So I'll just change it. It just means that the other values I gave before um, relative to the t-axis are just going to be in days rather than hours. Because I think that's a more sensible choice. I probably didn't think about units too much before preparing this video, but that's okay. So at 19.4 days, people can go back to there and they'll be relatively safe. They'll I'll have the minimum... Uh, or should I say, they'll have the maximum amount of radiation they can tolerate under the health recommended guidelines. Okay, so 19.4 days.
at 0.3c microsieverts. So it asks next whether the actual, um, actual answer we got there is suitable or whether it's subject to possibly being part of another model. So how accurate is the value that we just discovered for, zero, uh, for 0 0.37? Now something I probably should have pointed out is that this model was constructed uh, within the context of this question worth of, uh, from five days' worth of actual recordings. So from five days' worth of recordings, we were able to construct this here. So when we think about it, hang on, if that's five days there, it may not necessarily be a search function, because our first five days' worth of data only take us to the point of inflection. So we don't actually know what's going to happen after that. It could actually, you know, level off. The radiation could just remain there. There could be a certain level of radiation where the function just levels off and it can't go below that for a very long time because the rate of change doesn't really change. And although that wouldn't be a surge function, it could possibly happen in the real world because the surge function will say, okay, it's going to go down like that. But in the real world, something it may not necessarily fit a search function. It could be part of a very big polynomial, a very wide sort of uh, shape there, and a very uh, interesting shape parabola, uh, shall I say, polynomial, sorry, with multiple turning points. We don't technically know. I mean, it could be safe to assume that the uh, amount of radiation will decrease uh, and that you won't have a sudden spike where the radiation just goes up again unless there's another nuclear disaster. But for sure, we can't necessarily say that that's going to be the safe amount without recording the values over more days. Because again, it could change. It may not necessarily be a surge function. It's safe to say that the rate of radiation will always decrease. However, it's not safe to say necessarily. It's not accurate to say that after 19.4 days, you should send all your people back in there because they won't have any health risks or any health problems. So again, it depends really on the context of the problem as to how you answer that question. Because if we had 20 days worth of recordings and it fitted this model, then yes, it probably would be safer for people to go back there because they probably know that that value is there. Even if we had 18, it would probably be have more credibility because you could probably see that yes, it's decreasing and it's getting very close to that 0.37. But with only five days taking us to the point of inflection, it can be a little problematic because we don't necessarily know what's going to happen after there. I mean, if it does suit the surge function, that's good. That's fine. It will probably be okay for people to go back. But again, we just sort of need to think about how much data we have and uh, how credible the data is. This value isn't necessarily wrong, but it is subject to possibly not being correct. And uh, I think that's pretty much everything I want to cover in this video about surge functions. So uh, we've looked at the radio, uh, radiation application of um, surge functions, which is quite interesting. We've had a look at how we can calculate points of inflection, maximum values, the properties of these kind of functions, and also uh, how we can differentiate surge functions as well. So remember this sort of format here, if we were to look at just differentiating in general, you could see that you'd probably use product rule most of the time. So if you just got this general idea of how it will come out, so you know that that's going to be A, then it's going to be E to negative BT, and that's going to be plus, and that's going to be E to negative BT, lots of negative B, and then we're going to have AT on the end then you sort of know whether you're differentiating correctly or not in the test because you can have that general form or whether you're differentiating correctly when you're doing exercises. So just remember that our search functions, because of their format, and this also goes to logistic functions, should always have a general output as their derivative. So think about that and think about whether you're differentiating correctly. It's a great way to check. Okay, so I think that's pretty much all from me. Nothing else I wanted to say. There's a surge function. Again, it looks like this. It has a massive spike, and then it just goes down like that with a curve. Okay, so thank you for listening. Any questions, please put them below. 
Uh, I think this is the longest video I've ever done, just beating my original motion video. But uh, yeah, thank you very much everyone. Hopefully I wasn't too boring. See you later.